Hello, and welcome to today's podcast, where we're jumping into the astrology for this upcoming month of October 2022. And today I am joined by Charm Torres to help us walk through the month, see what's coming up, how we can live with it and live for it, and just have a sense of the schedule for the astrological weather. I am really excited about all the things we're going to talk about. We have a lot of movement, a lot of change happening, including the full moon in Aries. We have a partial solar eclipse in Scorpio, which kicks off Scorpio season, as well as we have, you know, the sun, Mercury and Venus all moving into there. And then we have Jupiter's final return to Pisces and then Mars stationing retrograde. So there's a lot going on. Charm Torres is a professional astrologer, tarot reader, and writer. She intends to support people to connect with their agency by offering nuanced and collaborative astrological narratives of her clients' lived experience. Charm is a contributor, has been featured in the Chani app, Cusp, Chatelaine, BBC, Global News Online, Influx Magazine, and Besides Online Magazine. She utilizes astrology and tarot as storytelling and remedial tools to understand human life and its various cycles and to assist people in mobilizing their healing and their goals. As an ancient wisdom system, Charm believes astrology can support humans in living life with reverence, grace, and humor. So we have a lot of fun doing this episode for you. Be sure to check out Charm's links below and leave us a comment if you're watching on YouTube or share the experience with a friend. And I hope you all enjoy the episode. Before we jump in, just a couple housekeeping notes. One, I know that there is usually a poem that goes with the forecast episode. However, now that we have guests joining us for the forecast, it doesn't quite feel like we do the poem justice when we just tag it along at the end to what now feels like a very different conversation. So we're stewing about how we can keep poetry very much alive and a part of, you know, this podcast and a part of your feed. So just bear with us as we come up with some more creative, more reverent solutions for that. In addition, we have some fun tools for you below. There's a houses cheat sheet in the show notes. So if you hear us talking today on the show, saying things like the Aries topics of your chart or the Libra topics of your chart, and you're like, I don't know what that means. I don't know what those are. Head to the show notes. Be sure to grab those. There's a free cheat sheet for yourself so you can learn what you can look for when we talk about those zodiac signs. We also have a digital calendar that we make each month that we use on Notion that creates a searchable database for where you can put all of your transits coming up for the month so that you can work them into your workspace, into your calendar, into your task list. And it becomes a very functional, fun, and interactive space for you to really utilize and make tangible the transits in your day-to-day life. So you can learn more about the Cosmic Calendar at the link below in the show notes as well and subscribe to get yours if you're interested. Okay, I think that gets all of our housekeeping notes done and ready to jump into this upcoming month that I won't delay any longer. So let's head into the Astro for October 22 with Charm Torres. So hello, Um, Hello. welcome (laughs) to the Homebody Podcast where we're gonna dive into the forecast, the astrology forecast for October of 2022. And Charm, would you mind kicking us off by just letting the listeners know you know, how you would like them to know you today and sort of what's most forward about who you are before we dive into the stars? For sure. Hello, everyone. I'm Charm Torres. Um, I I guess today I, I am a professional astrologer, just like Mary Grace, but I always like to sort of just describe the work as I'm a diviner, I'm a guide helping people navigate their life. You know, primarily using the tool of astrology, uh, but also tarot, because I also read tarot cards, as well as through writing. So a lot of that work kind of happens in those those kind of parameters. And, you know, occasionally showing up and chatting with my peers (laughs) about the astrological weather. So I'm really excited to be here. I can't believe we're at the last quarter of 2022 Mm -hmm. and yeah there's some juicy juicy stuff coming up that we're gonna unpack for everyone (laughs) (laughs) yes it is juicy maybe it's the hashtag for this month um um, I just had a moment wondering if Lizzo was a Libra maybe she is um Mm, Lisa Shine no, someone else. Lizzo, because I was thinking of oh, like Lizzo. Juicy and Juice and oh. I, went, I went there. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> so I guess we're going to start. The first thing we're going to talk about today is probably something a lot of people are waiting for, which is on Sunday, October 2nd, Mercury will station direct oh. in Virgo. I know I'm generally yeah. excited about it to have Mercury uh-huh. sort of functioning again. How are you feeling about Mercury going direct? 
You know what? I actually just had like an interesting reflection on 2022's Mercury retrograde patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking, I guess um, for this round, at least on a personal level, I didn't feel the 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 sort of like the pop culture phenomenon of like <laughs> Mercury retrograde bashing. Um, so it was pretty chill for me, but I was just reflecting how, oh, this is the last pattern of uh, Mercury retrograding, you know, like starting from an air sign towards an earth sign, because as we move into next year, it would just be all earth signs which is a feature of Mercury retrograde. So um, so I thought that Mercury, the Mercury retrogrades of 2022 in ways acted almost like a mediator between the Saturn-Uranus square climate landscape mm -hmm. that we're still <laughs> <laughs> moving through. Um, but yes, so we do have Mercury finally moving forward, though, which is exciting on October 2nd at 24 degrees Virgo. So, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm definitely excited about it. I think they're, you know, when Mercury stations direct, they will also be pretty closely opposite Neptune. So I had just uh -huh. this thing of this things being kind of like dusty. It's sort of like Mercury like uh -huh. wakes up a little bit more and there's like a little bit of a mess and there's some dust yeah. on the books or like a cloud of confusion or even <laughs> misconception or deception. It's like, oh, Mercury's yeah. gonna have to like clean up a little bit. Like this has to be packed away. This has to be dusted off. Mm -hmm. um, and now that I've dusted this off, I can see that it says this and not uh -huh. that, you know, a lot uh -huh. of like clarity and like putting things um, back in order. And I think, you know, Mercury and Virgo can definitely help us tidy up and get things yes. working again. Mm -hmm. um, I know for me, anytime Mercury goes retrograde, even a little bit in Libra, it is insanely disorienting for me. Last year, oh. it was like, it was terrible. Um, oh. So I'm really... Uh, I just get whacked out. I don't know why, but I'm, so I'm really <laughs> excited about Mercury stationing direct and having just some help, like, mm -hmm. you know, rolling with the tasks and like, you know, getting that abandoned filing system back in order, or the email yes. threads or whatever. So getting back to mm -hmm. Mercury business. So that's and just... I love, I love the dusty reference. <laughs> like, that's so good. I hate dust. Like, it's just, <laughs> it's like part of life. You always have to dust. Um, mm -hmm. But the, yeah, the opposition with Neptune with this station, it's interesting because, um, right around the pre-retrograde shadow was the first time Mercury opposed Neptune. So that was like August 21st. And then now it's happening again. So it's always interesting, this cycle of like, it's almost, I imagine Mercury entering like a wormhole mm -hmm. and then now sort of re-entering it, but in a way also departing. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like moving out of like opposition with Neptune eventually. So yeah, like re-entry, perhaps. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. that makes a lot of sense. Uh -huh. um, I like the wormhole analogy. <laughs> um, and then do you have anything else you want to say about week one? I know there's a couple other things going on, but to me, Mercury stationing retrograde feels uh -huh. the loudest. I think um, you mentioned it, actually, you brought it to my attention when we were preparing for this, that uh, like sort of the first almost the first half of October is when Saturn and Uranus is like still within like a degree mm, of mm -hmm. squaring each other um, we know that in 2022 they squared each other exactly three times throughout the year in 2021, 2021 did I say yeah. 2022 okay. um, but for <laughs> but for this year um, this is this might be the touchstone where they get the closest, but they are like ships sailing in the night where they, you know, Uranus is going backward as like Saturn is moving forward. So I guess as a translation, I feel like, especially with Mercury going direct as well, this feels like a, a week where there is a lot of clarifying that will happen around, I guess, realizing the changes that are taking place in people's established reality. And it's nothing new. We've been going through this to some degree personally, something we see out in the world since last year, pretty much. Uh, and then I think this year, like, speaking of dust, it's like sort of settling in um, and figuring out how best to move forward. So I just, yeah, so we're going to kind of feel that angst 
again this month. <laughs> yeah. Angst is a great word. Yeah. I like, yeah. It just feels like the sort of, you know, cause we have like Saturn it's, it's sort of like it, sh- it can show up for us personally, but especially cause the, you know, the outer plane is kind of this kind of background noise or background climate. It's sort of like when we think of the, the yeah, the backdrop of what's happening in our lives. Mm-hmm. And so it feels important to mention and describe like you did, because it's, you know, we could be describing some other transits without mentioning that oh, October feels sort of like breezy, but there's this like kind of background, like slow collecting fit tense, angsty thing happening, um, mm-hmm. that we won't talk a lot about today, but it is something yeah. that's like gathering again. And, you know, but again, like you said, it's not like we've been in it and we're just going to be in it some more. Yeah. It's like a re it's like a, Oh, reminder, you know, not so gentle reminder, <laughs> yeah. but this is still, this is still the plot. Like this is still the arc of the plot that we're, we're moving through. And I guess like, this is when, when you, you know, when you sit with people one-on-one or if you attend like because I know you host community groups um you know you get to figure out where in your own chart that this is possibly taking place uh, but it's definitely more of a longer term bigger picture lingering situation yeah. yeah that's just gonna feel a lot more poignant this particular time of the year yeah for sure um I think the only other kind of big outer planet thing I want to mention, and I, we don't have to spend a lot of time on, is that Pluto will station direct on oh, yes. October 8th in Capricorn. Mm. And again, more of a sort of collective, big picture, long term force and story, but definitely makes me feel like any kind of big power players, whether those be like countries or prominent people if they've been at all like kind of hanging back that perhaps now that Pluto stations direct, they'll be sort of a little more dominant, a little more forward, a little more forthright. If I think about it, like on a chess table, a chess board or something, it's like Mm. more actively or more aggressively like playing the game. And yeah. So, I mean, I think that's a good point too. I tend to, I guess for these like monthly slices of, you know, looking at things, I tend to forego looking at the like a Pluto station. However, you're right, because I think this would be when Pluto is just like moving through the last degrees of Capricorn and pretty much will enter Aquarius <laughs> like by March 2023. But then it will return to Capricorn for a bit. But this is when it's going to really finish out that the last few degrees of Capricorn, which is wild. So, yeah, it is. <laughs> so um, I think that takes us to Sunday, October 9th, where we have the full moon in yeah. Aries, which feels mm. it feels really dynamic, among other things. Um, do you mm-hmm. want to kick us off with the full moon in Aries? How are you thinking about it or framing it? I guess uh, when I, I love looking at the sort of the bigger wheel of the year with any lunation, particularly with the full moon. So I think a lot about, oh, what was happening at the last new moon in Aries, you know, when we, that was, I think, around end of March. So, you know, during Aries season, obviously. Um, and I think at the time, the new moon in Aries was also in the sort of second, you know, like within the same similar degrees um, of this current full moon that also coincide with the three of wands. So I tend to actually look at the tarot signifier, just an added layer of support <laughs> to make sense of it. But for sure, for folks, you know, the full moon in Aries would tell you the this is a culmination point in this bigger cycle of whatever has started for you since pretty much like end of March of this year. So for people who know their charts, they can look at the Aries area of their chart to see what that's possibly about, you know, what has grown since then. Because when we think of the full moon, that's like a full illumination. Like this is like when things are on the stage, you know, being highlighted and shown. There's there's things that you're having to I guess, like, find out as the truth and having to integrate things that maybe feel dissonant at this point in that in that process. Mm-hmm. And also interesting to think of this full moon as, like, 
about to have a supportive relationship with Saturn in Aquarius too. So that feels really grounding as well. Because in general, like um, just from a mundane perspective, when the sun and the moon are opposite from an embodied point of view, that's uncomfortable because oppositions are generally, you know, it's like discomfort. Um, but I feel like that additional supportive relationship with Saturn, which is what we call a sextile, that, that can feel really grounding, you know, in a sense that if you had to cut things out, you had, if you had to Take, the, take some excess away, it'll probably feel good to have those like limiting boundaries that, you know, otherwise, maybe in some context, it could feel oppressive, but technically speaking, it'll probably be really good to like take off some excess baggage, whatever this full moon could mean for you personally. Yeah. Oh, and actually, I didn't complete that thought about the three of wands. Oh, okay. um, but I was thinking about just like three of wands as like kind of being at the threshold of discovery and like a threshold of like, you know, departing from a previous kind of like binary and then moving towards something that's a lot more integrated. But a lot of it like requires like some kind of momentum to move forward. Whereas you're usually maybe like, held back by some kind of inertia from the past. You have to kind of like push through it. So that might be a bit of like that discomfort, but but in general, you know, like Aries is very courageous, <laughs> <laughs> quite like quite like excited to initiate things. So, so that's my interpretation. How about you? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I agree with all that. I, especially the, you know, getting support from Saturn, which sometimes that kind of support is more just like, it feels kind of heavy or limiting. And mm -hmm. sometimes we can for just forget that like limitations can help us just mm -hmm. like, you know, having a boundary for a fire makes the fire productive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so Saturn's attorney and support may not be like our favorite kind all the time, but it can be really helpful. And I feel like sometimes Aries where they can, who's not Aries isn't really like concerned about like boundaries or limits so much could it could mm -hmm. be a really like exaggerated heroic effort totally. but then Saturn really bringing some of that like stability and support or just some backing or mm -hmm. infrastructure to yes. like to the effort I think so it's like not it's like the work smarter not harder <laughs> I feel mm -hmm. like um totally I think it, that's such a good point too around uh, containing the fire <laughs> to make it more productive because this full moon would be ruled by a Mars in Gemini, which I feel like stokes that fire of, you know, just like going big or, you know, <laughs> go big or go bigger. So I feel like the sextile with Saturn can be really helpful to just like organize and get grounded. Mm, organize I love that um contain in a helpful way um <laughs> and I think it's also I don't talk about Chiron a lot on the podcast but the full moon is also like very close to, I just Ooh. hit my microphone <laughs> is also very close to Chiron and oh, it made okay. me which I only noticed because I have a lot of friends right now who are going through like their Chiron return and okay so just thinking that maybe you know maybe this, whether it's a Chiron return, or maybe we have like an opportunity to sort of, you know, to have a new perspective or a new understanding or a culmination of some kind around any healing journeys that may be happening in Aries or in the topics of Aries in our chart right now. Mm -hmm. And they may be adjacent to things around our capabilities or mm -hmm. our efforts or our ability to save ourselves or be mm -hmm. ourselves or, mm -hmm. and how that relates to our relationships with others. Yeah. especially because we have that sun moon opposition for the full moon. And so it's a really mm. strong pull between the Libra, which is the, the relational, the, we, the compromising, so we can be together. Mm. And then the Aries, which is the, like the me, the I, my heroic effort, my bravery, my courage, totally. there are no compromises. There is only my mission or, you know, whatever it yes. is. So I yeah. think we, we will really feel that tension and maybe that Chiron conjunction could um, either, you know, just bring the concept or the, the highlighting of any healing journeys or new perspectives that have been happening along that path. I love that. I love that a lot. Yeah. Sort of like the wounds of authenticity in a, mm -hmm. in a bigger picture. Cause yeah, Chiron's a long transit, mm -hmm. but the, this full moon is possibly, yeah, touching on those sore spots this time. Wow. Wow. Well, like, oh, we're just doing so good. Um, <laughs> 
And then I think next we're moving to, and always stop me if I mess up something or I forget something. Oh, no. Very possible. <laughs> um, I think next we're moving on to Mercury is going to enter Libra again now that Mercury uh-huh. is direct. And this is happening yes. on October 10th. So, like you pointed out earlier, Mercury retrogrades this year, sort of straddling air signs and earth signs. So, Mercury was in Libra, went uh-huh. back into Virgo on the retrograde, and now that they're direct, is moving back into Libra for the second time. So, they're still uh-huh. in their shadow phase like they're still going back over ground they've done before yes. um but the change in sign will also be a pretty big change in tone I think how are you oh, feeling yeah. about it <laughs> yeah I mean I think you will bring in sort of tagging along to the full moon conversation is that you will bring in that opposition to Jupiter eventually again mm-hmm. so in a way when Mercury was moving through Libra and then retrograde you know moved backward again um, it basically had already opposed Jupiter twice so this this forward motion it's gonna oppose Jupiter which is in Aries um, for the final and third time. And it's always interesting to imagine these like three hit contacts during retrograde periods. It's like, I think of like the first hit as like, oh, something is being introduced here as a potential thing you need to, you're going to need to look back at. And then the second time is usually when, you know, in this case, Mercury was already <laughs> retrograde. You're like, oh, okay. Like, well, whatever was introduced the first time, I'm having to revisit. And then the third time, hopefully, Uh, gives you a sense of you know resolution on how to move forward and I feel like Mercury's re-entry into Libra and then opposing Jupiter is so much of that um, I guess like when I think from a planetary point of view Mercury is so much about the gathering of data whereas Jupiter is so much about harmonizing the big picture meaning of things so this opposition is about that kind of um, putting things together somehow and you know the nuance of them being in those signs that they're in as well so again it it highlights the Aries and Libra axis of your personal charts again (laughs) again uh, yeah for sure and yeah it feels you know Mercury is still like in Libra perhaps more other oriented than project oriented, for instance, in Virgo, it may be more about the task than it is about another. Um, but perhaps in Mercury, in Libra, Mercury might be more other oriented, more people mm-hmm. oriented, or mediation oriented. Um, so I think while there still may be some messes getting cleaned up that will need mm-hmm. to be solved, they may now be more in a relational tone, yes. and now sort of looking to Venus for the help. Who she's already been in there, kind of cleaning up a little bit, and now yeah. Mercury's like here to help, not just make it organized, but we're also going to make it pretty. So, mm-hmm. um, and mm-hmm. how do we get it so we can like get along and make it social? I think in a di- whereas yeah. in Virgo, Mercury is more like how do we just make it really good? <laughs> yeah, and it's actually you're, that's such a good point to bring up. The ruler of Mercury this time, which is, you know, now has come home <laughs> to Venus in Libra back in September 29th, because Venus wasn't in Libra at the time when it first retrogrades. So I feel like this, yeah, this will really bring such a big layer of, you know, when it when we think of like Venus as archetypally about justice in any kind of context, you know, something about that unfolding <laughs> in this, in this you know, like sort of like the last leg of this Mercury retrograde cycle. Mm. Totally. Yeah. Like put it, what should this cost? What should, Mm -hmm. how should this, what get part of getting it in order is like restoring a sense of fairness or justice Mm -hmm. or balance Mm -hmm. in some way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah. We're pointing that out. Mm. Um, Oh yeah. And then October 17th is when that's the date Mercury finally leaves it's like post retrograde shadow so it will like kind of like go through new 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 landscape in a way as it finishes its time in in Libra yeah new new sources new data Mm -hmm. (laughs) which sounds exciting um (laughs) Where do we want to land next? The next thing I have highlighted is not till week four, which is pretty busy um, Mm -hmm. in October. Do you want to go ahead and jump there? I feel like week three, like there are some things happening, but they're not super loud. Is there anything that you want to mention there before we scoot over? 
I guess I feel like that, yeah, before the intensity of the last week of October, <laughs> a lot of it is like, you know, like the, it's like the last minute, like, scuffle of Libra season before we descend to the depths of, of, of Scorpio season. It's pretty much like a lot of, uh, I guess, like Venus, as well as the sun going through like different kinds of aspects with with the planets at the later degrees and then they come together at some point um is that the same timeline you're looking at or yeah i have so mid october and it's sort of interesting because you know they're like oh these are like soft things so like we'll have venus we'll try and saturn on october mm-hmm. 14th or at least mm-hmm. october 14th my time Mm. Um, and then on Tuesday, October 18th, Venus will try and Mars. So essentially mm-hmm. because they're all in air signs right now, Venus is sort of going to pass through these like harmonious relationships yes. with the malefic planets and air signs, yeah. which is interesting, you know, yeah. it's sort of like, and she's really dignified right now. Like she's really yes. like capable. She's in her house. She's in her sign. And she's sort of like, she's like harness these bad boys to like do her, you know, like they're helping <laughs> each other out. Or so I just yeah. saw her like grabbing the reins in a way and just Good like point. having her way with it. Cause she's way better, you know, positioned than they are right now. I think, mm-hmm. what do you think about that? I love that image. Cause like, that's sort of like, it's almost like Venus is moving through forming this like grand trine and mm-hmm. the sun is sort of doing the same thing because they're going to catch up with each other um, but that's interesting to think of like a benefic planet like Venus having this conversation with the the two malefic planets it almost feels like um, Venus in Libra is helping us get settled into Mars Gemini being there for a while <laughs> <laughs> you know like sort of like you have we've come into that reality at the end of August with Mars being in Gemini forever well not forever but like seven months <laughs> a long um, but then, time totally and then Venus in Libra is like okay everyone this is the possible like fun you can have actually <laughs> with Mars in Gemini um and yeah I feel like that it feels like a, a kind of like a host like showing us like how you can have fun with this potential setup for like you know the next half year (laughs) (laughs) I was imagining as you were like personifying that situation I was imagining Venus being like and have a drink you know (laughs) totally like offering you a drink as well totally this requires a kind of you know drink support (laughs) yeah (laughs) just have a beverage it'll be fine (laughs) Um, even if it's not fine it'll be fine Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. for sure and I think on on the topic of air science too like what I love to think about with air elements is that air elements are potential oriented that's why they're really good at like imagination and concepts and ideas and ideals like very idealistic actually but also like quite strategic and logical in a sense so I feel like Venus in Libra can is sort of helping us kind of see how we could potentially like cognitively make sense of you know what's going on in our lives uh, particularly if we kind of highlight Mars being in Gemini like in the Gemini portion of your chart because you know for most of the time Saturn will still be in Aquarius while that's happening so it it, it has a pretty kind of hefty weight of like this feels like a kind of reality that people will kind of contend with for some time in a way mm-hmm. that's going to linger even beyond Mars moving on later on. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think the last thing I was in picturing this sort of grand trine moment in week three, where, you know, at the same time, we'll have Saturn and Uranus sort of peaking in their yeah. tension at the same yeah. time. And then we have like Venus, Saturn and Mars kind of lock. If I'm picturing kind of like a gear, they just kind of like lock into place for a second. Mm. And what is that kind of synchronicity as well between those, the air signs in our charts, like those topics mm. kind of like working together for a second to like yeah. bring about some sense of like flow or harmony, kind of like, you know, the recycle symbol, like how, what is yes. that going to do? Mm-hmm. So. I love that. Um, and cool. I'm yes. glad we didn't skip that. Um, (laughs) the next thing I have is October 22nd where Venus conjoins the sun, um, which I'm excited about because it's a new cycle for Uh Venus. Um, Uh do you want to start us going down that road or would you like me to, what would feel good? You you can start. (laughs) Um, as I'm like, I'm so excited about it. Um, (laughs) 
So Venus conjoining the sun in this position is going to start a new like synodic cycle or a new cycle for Venus in relationship mm-hmm. to the sun. And, and because it's happening in Libra, then the things that Venus cares the most about in Libra are going to be a big ingredient in this new Venus chapter. Mm-hmm. So it's like, again, bringing up those things that we talked about earlier, these things like relationships and mediation and diplomacy and advocacy and justice and um, maybe even also initiating things like art or commerce, right? Because we have mm-hmm. the scales that are, the scales are showing us what's weighing in the balance for justice, but they also mm-hmm. measure things like payment and compensation. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, this will bring Venus into her evening star position and this conjunction, mm-hmm. she's really, you know, received into the heart of the sun and like reinvigorated and inspired and enlivened uh-huh. sort of to start this fresh journey. And mm-hmm. This cycle, because a new one is beginning, it's also closing one that began Uh back in March of 2021. And Mm. in that cycle, this Venus was in Aries. So it was in the opposite of where it is now. So again, we have that like the similar echoes to some of the things we've been talking about, the sort of oppositions and also the complementary themes of Mm. Aries and Libra in our chart. So Mm -hmm. maybe thinking back like, you know, how have some of those topics evolved? How have some of your relational stories or your values or um, the sort of me and we scales, how have they evolved over the last, mm-hmm. since March of 2021? And wow. I'm not, I don't want to make it sound like, you know, one is necessarily better than the other because mm-hmm. like they're opposite, but they are complementary as well. Like they want different mm-hmm. things, but we need both of them. And that individual, that relational, the heroic, the creative social. And Mm -hmm. I feel like it's this new chapter is because it's so opposite of perhaps what we've been working on in the previous cycle. It's like, Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of like, if you're working out your arms, it's like, oh, you do the biceps. And we've been like doing biceps for like this whole cycle. And now we're Mm -hmm. switching cycles. We're like, and now we'll do triceps so that we can have like a more balanced function, which is of course Mm -hmm. what Libra wants is like a balanced quest. But Mm -hmm. so those are all, those are, I don't know. I just threw a bunch of things in a pot, but those are what I'm thinking about for this cycle. How about you? I love that so much. I love that you brought in the whole bigger Venus cycle, like the Venus cycle with the sun, actually. Because the cause yeah, Venus's cycles are actually quite exquisite and beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, and and also when I think when you mentioned the evening star piece, I was just like, oh yeah, Venus loves being an evening star, actually. Uh, so that's really, yeah, I I love that. And I guess the poetry of it, like that Venus enters Scorpio the day after but but (laughs) in a way that kind of that initiation is like really beautiful and on the topic of oppositions too which you've sort of really unpacked is like I I always like to think of how opposing signs in some way have like such a shared core desire but their methodologies in some way just is so opposite or so different but at the end of the day they actually share something quite core Mm -hmm. um so so yeah that's really that's really cool I I don't have anything more to add you did it so great I just talked a lot (laughs) Um, and then for me, I guess Saturn stationing direct is what happens next for me, sort of the next few things are all happening on October 23rd in the Eastern time zone where I live. Uh Um, Uh but for, I think a lot of people, anyone who's on like a later time, the Saturn stationing direct will be October 22nd. So it'll be that Uh sleep between the 22nd and 23rd. Uh Um, do you want to say anything about Saturn stationing direct? Oh my gosh, because yeah, this this station direct at 18 degrees, I guess I'm thinking more around what happens afterwards, but definitely for folks who's been, you know, having Saturn kind of linger these degrees for for some time <laughs> this year, yeah, it's finally going to move on, um, particularly I think folks with uh, significant fixed sign placement, so that's like Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, Aquarius, you know, Saturn has been uh, on the agenda of stabilizing these parts of your life in ways that may be felt have been feeling really restrictive or like where you have to be really disciplined (laughs) to figure Mm -hmm. out how to like you know like kind of like structure those those parts of your life but yeah this 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 station this moving forward would kind of bring us to a close with 
Saturn, Aquarius journey eventually, eventually, you know, that I'm going really far ahead. I tend to always look at big cycles. <laughs> um, I know we're just thinking about October, but, you know, just sort of like thinking about how, oh yeah, Saturn's going to start to pick up the speed and clear out you know, the Saturn Aquarius eventually. So we're at the, I think of like the last leg of its journey. Yeah. I mean, I think that's really helpful to contextualize for people that, I mean, this is kind of a big shift, a sort of like a beginning of an end, um, Mm -hmm. which we'll have when we talk about Jupiter in a minute too. I feel like, you know, it's a pivot in a change in stance for Saturn. Like Saturn has been really powerful here, but also has been sort of retrograding and been more interested in kind of going back over, returning to, you know, what's already been done. And again, now more like forward looking agendas, again, kind of going Mm -hmm. back to looking towards new ground. And Mm -hmm. I feel like it's also happening close to Uranus, like we said. So it may also that change in stance or that change in direction may appear antagonistic towards whatever Uranus is trying to accomplish Mm -hmm. in those kind of polarized environments that have been cropping Mm -hmm. up everywhere. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. But I think too, with Saturn stationing direct, it's like all the things that Saturn really brings are sort of like maybe reinforced or reinstated. So yeah. if they're like may, limits are coming, maybe some limits are returning, some boundaries are returning, some rules um, that come up again or get reinforced mm-hmm. in some way. And mm-hmm. um, if Saturn is either a really important planet for you and your chart personally, or in this, a particular timing cycle in your life. It's like, if mm-hmm. Saturn's aging retrograde, it's like, it's going slower than slow. Yes. And now it'll at least it'll be back to like just regular slow. Now that mm-hmm. Saturn is going direct. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's definitely that image of like backing up your car before you move forward kind of motion. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's such a good point. Cause it's almost like this, this, this forward motion, might be one of those like acceptance of the new normal, to be honest. <laughs> We've been kind of like fiddling with it um, in a way uh, for, for most of the year. But like as 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 things kind of settle in, it feels very much like, oh, this is this is the new reality that we're living with now. How can we adjust um, to this? So mm. mm-hmm. I think next on the menu, we have, Mm. you know, Venus and as you know, they just had their conjunction. And so Venus will enter Scorpio. And then a couple hours later, the sun will enter Scorpio, which is a pretty Mm. change, pretty big change in tone. I think, Mm -hmm. how are you feeling about the Scorpio weather? That's uh, October 23rd. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love Scorpio. (laughs) Spoken by someone with Scorpio stellium, but um, I definitely love the season of Scorpio because it's such an opportunity to, um, you know, when I think of the you know, the solar principle um, in, in a traditional way, we think a lot of the sun as being so connected to the soul or spirit. And in some way, it's like thinking about how we kind of build towards that sense of aliveness and whenever the sun is in that sort of like deep waters of Scorpio we get to be really honest you know like we get to kind of figure out in the most honest way how to how to like unpack you know things for ourselves and with Venus's you know like Venus being in this journey with the sun this time um, again like when we've talked about the significations of Venus, like, for example, just like the relationships, you know, our relationship to desire, our relationship to our our sense of creativity, um, like a lot of like relational themes will go through like this diving deep <laughs> moment. Um, and I guess for for folks who live in the Northern Hemisphere, it's just like, added poetry to have like the longest night (laughs) during you know like less daylight hours more longer nights uh, more darkness during this time of the year um which to me just kind of adds into that sort of like almost a hermit quality um to this time of the year but as usual you know for folks it's always this time of the year that the sun illuminates or highlight this part of your or chart, which is the Scorpio house in your chart. Uh, so often it's like, there's like thematic focus to this part of the life that the sun highlights. Um, and I mean, every time planets 
enter fix signs <laughs> we already know yeah. <laughs> you know for since 2020 in a sense that they're having to confront again like the bigger collective story which we've been talking about between Saturn and Uranus so yeah but also more to that in a second <laughs> yeah totally <laughs> hold please um <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree. I love all the things that you said. I definitely think Venus and the sun entering, it'll be a pretty noticeable change in tone. I feel like Scorpio brings a lot of like tenacity and exertion and like willpower. Ooh. It's like very um, high ninja energy to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Like it kind of like needs a challenge or like a difficulty to overcome whether it wants one or not. And I think, you know, Venus doesn't necessarily want that or need that, but it mm -hmm. just comes with the territory in Scorpio. So our relationships mm -hmm. and the ways that we're relating, we're going to find these, you know, if we go down deep enough, we're going to find something that we're going to have to like work around or work with mm -hmm. and we'll find the challenge. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, I think also to like Scorpio things, they tend because there's this, this I think a, an impulse towards like that exertion that will, I'm thinking of my husband was telling me about somebody who was like, this guy was like the first person to pull some, I don't know what he did, but I'll make it up. It's like pull a sled for like, you know, ridiculous amount of miles across the Arctic by himself. Wow. And I'm like, cool. But like in my head, I'm like, why would someone even care about that? Like, why would we put our, why would we voluntarily put ourselves in that situation? Like who mm. needs to be that guy? And it's like, Scorpio mm. needs to be that guy. You know, mm. it's like Scorpio mm. wants something that's going to ask for that strength and that strategy and that endurance, those mm. like in those high ninja skills. And mm -hmm. so we may find like in Scorpio, those things kind of pivoting more towards like finding a challenge or finding like uh, some kind of like exertion that we might be like proud of once we like, get through it and feel strong and you know uh -huh. Bruce Lee about it um uh -huh, uh -huh. but uh it may not always be like the most fun trip you know but it's it's got something like yeah it's it's down under there so that's a good point I mean in like the sort of like the traditional scheme like Venus tends to um like objectively speaking, have a harder time in Scorpio compared to, for example, it's like home sign in Taurus, which, yeah, like that's a good point. It's like you go, you willingly go through these kinds of trials and tribulations in a way to find like some kind of evidence of your own strength. <laughs> um, but also I think there's a desire, I feel like with Scorpio, there's always a desire to overcome something that that sort of almost consumes and possess you, that you kind of want to, yeah, you want to overcome that and sort of prove to yourself that you could kind of like face that in a way that's like, yeah, this, this doesn't have to keep me. <laughs> Nothing's going to keep me down. Yeah, yeah. totally. And so it, it does have like that. I mean, at the end of the day, Scorpio is the water, you know, like the, the night waters of Mars. So mm -hmm. it's all about precision. Like Mars loves to, strike at the heart of the matter and, and this is what sort of what I was talking about with honesty like sort of just like raw honesty um into you know like especially in contexts where there's like conflict or issues or problems um I feel like Scorpio season can be really helpful at just like digging at the truth that maybe you would normally skirt around or like avoid um mm -hmm. totally <laughs> It makes me think of, you know, when we talk about like, oh, I'm going to be like water and like flow around a rock. And like, we have kind of a relaxing way that we tend to think about it. But then if uh, we think about like Bruce Lee saying, be like water, like it means something else. And I think uh, the Bruce Lee version is like what the Scorpio and be like water is like, uh, it's like, oh, I'll move around you, but it's to like grab your arm into this lock and like flip over or whatever, and like ooh. punch you in the, like there's that precision, that like high skill, that child, those things that you were saying. And the, the Martian martial artist reference <laughs> yeah I always think of I always think of Bruce Lee when I get into Scorpio territory mm. because he was just like such a Scorpio in so mm. many ways yeah um, I mean like Scorpio waters to me is like very like like you know like deep deep ocean floor where there's actually no sunlight like the yeah. sun actually doesn't penetrate there and like the creatures start to look really alien like yeah totally. <laughs> you know, they're like not we like I feel like we maybe. Uh, this is very generalized but it's like we feel I feel like we've really explored the outer space way more than our ocean floors to be we honest have. we um, have like, actually 
the creatures you know that lurk in the in that <laughs> ocean floor that feels very Scorpio which has that theme of like finding out those like really dark pockets and like uncovering things so totally and if we think of the sun being like the light you know it's like the mm-hmm. light just like if you're in that dark and suddenly someone turns the light on you're like oh yeah. like what is that like barracuda <laughs> looking dragon fish that's yeah. like you know, oh I didn't realize oh, it that looked- was in the corner oh my god yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally totally yeah, yeah. um <laughs> And kind of similar variation on a theme is we have a partial solar eclipse at two degrees of Scorpio, and that's happening on October 25th. So I think there's a little more, you know, it's a lot more, more of that, (laughs) more of all the things we just said. Do you want to say anything about the solar eclipse? Yeah, I mean, I feel like this is, we're entering, I guess this is what we kept like like uh, like leading towards like the the climax of the the months like juicy astrology is that we're entering scorp and like eclipse eclipse season and i feel like this this eclipse with scorpio like this partial solar eclipse would be the first like sort of like new moon eclipse in Scorpio sign because even though we've been experiencing eclipses in the axis of Taurus and Scorpio since about November 2021, um, we haven't had like a solar or new moon eclipse in Scorpio. And it's always so paradoxical because we know that the eclipses that are moving through Scorpio uh, has the quality of the south node and the south node of the moon, which is, I guess, like literally like the south pole of the moon, uh, symbolically has such a like a purging quality to it. So the paradox, the paradox of like a, a sort of a solar eclipse or a new moon eclipse is that, oh, like a, a, the the ending is a beginning is an end, you know, like that sort of like you lead, you you go out through one door and enter another. Um, and so in a way, this solar eclipse happening at two degrees Scorpio, you can imagine in your charts as, oh, there's like a potent beginning happening in this area of your life, which is part of that bigger eclipse story that started in November 2021, um, is also signifying some kind of end. And, you know, when I think of the tarot, um, signification, this is like a five of cups moment, which uh, shows an image of, I guess, like grieving loss and accepting loss, but also just the reality of that heartbreak. So there's some, there's, there's an element of potency there. And eclipse moments are often pretty potent, you know, in terms of how it even just energetically feels like it feels like a bigger, bigger kind of um moment of reckoning (laughs) I don't know if you want to add more to that yeah no I was thinking the word punctuation was coming to mind Mm. um Mm -hmm. yeah emphasize yeah for sure um yeah and it definitely you know it's we have so we have like the sun and we have the moon and we have Venus now all like kind of piled into Scorpio and neither the Venus nor the moon really like to be there they're not like Mm. comfortable there if so because it feels like finding things that feel comfortable might be hard because um, uh-huh. the environment one. of Scorpio is just so spiky uh-huh. um, and interesting, um, but also spiky. And so in uh-huh. Venus or the moon are sort of those things that can l- like to bring us those like simple pleasures, those comforts, those things that feel nice. Uh-huh. Um, and those just may be uh-huh. feeling a little harder to access. Like, yeah. um, and when you were talking about, you know, it being on the South node, that, that energy of like releasing or dispersing or casting it to the wind, just sort of thinking mm-hmm. about that phrase, like, if you love something, you got to let it go. And then mm-hmm. like, maybe also you got to like fight for it and like fight to let it go because it's in mm-hmm. Scorpio or it's like, mm-hmm. there's like maybe some wrestling, there's some deep work. It's very like, you were saying earlier, kind of like down in the depths of the ocean, it's very under the current and down there, you're like, you're not getting tossed around by the waves so much but there's also Mm -hmm. more like pressure down there, Mm -hmm. right? You have to hold your breath for longer. And there's, again, Mm -hmm. there's that more strange creatures, there's more darkness. It's not comfortable. You have to be really that, that hyper alert. And Mm -hmm. yeah, there may have to be some things that we have to like wrangle free or sort of like look at that we don't want to, in order to let something go in order to walk through a new door or in order Mm -hmm. to have that new thing. Yeah. And I think the five of cups is such a, like sweet 
reminder to like that grief and grieving is so non-linear like that mm -hmm. experience um there's no like set you know like guidepost or like st stops of where you're supposed to be within that cycle of grieving and I feel like this moment is really kind of bringing that up like and to bring up Venus's and Moon's you know mundane objective discomfort in the sign of Scorpio uh, you know that doesn't necessarily translate as anything kind of doomy about someone's personal placement if you have True. those placements but it's just more like like what you said that was so good just like harder to access like the lunar and venus you know like their their principle of pleasure and connection um and in some ways it happens through like yeah like the very like sharp <laughs> sharp edge environment that mars offers in scorpio so it's like a lot of hard conversations with people you really care about it's like confronting maybe like really difficult like memories because I sometimes really think of water too as like just like vessels and holders of memory and lineage <laughs> so there's a lot of like having to integrate maybe like difficult past into the current moment um yeah and like because this this solar eclipse is conjoined you know Venus because they just you know they just entered this 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 like environment so yeah there's a I would feel like there would be a lot of like Venusian themes like even actually we haven't mentioned like um Venus has having to do with like our sense of beauty in relationship to beauty um you know and desire and desirability there's a lot of that um and I feel like um I guess like this can bring up maybe like uh, a harsh or like even like the toxic ways we relate to those topics in a mm. way, like personally, even collectively, and how to kind of heal from that. Um, and I guess from like a bigger picture thing, this like just the reminder of like the Taurus Scorpio batches of eclipses, um, you know, like the last time we were having this like axis of eclipses like from an inverse nodal perspective was 2012 to 2014 and then even beyond that was 2002 to 2005 which would have been the same nodal arrangement so you can look back to those times of your life like about nine years ago to see oh, what was going on then to maybe make sense of this current solar eclipse in Scorpio. Yeah, that's a really good reminder to kind of help self contextualize too. Yeah, it's like, what do we, because these fixed areas too, like equip, eclipses, how do I want to say that? Like these fixed areas are areas in life that might be more reluctant to change on their own. Uh -huh. And so like having something like an eclipse, like it may feel sort of like we're wrestling an alligator to sort of wrangle free of a pattern or to get some sort of change, but you know. It feels mm -hmm. like something like this could make that possible, even if it's like, well, you're going to have to swim down here and like, go find that thing and look at that crazy fish and hold your breath a long time. You know, it's like, well, I don't want to do that, but that's like how you got to do it to get through the level. So, mm -hmm. yeah. It's like the work. That's the point of being alive. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> there's, yeah. There's just moments where you realize, oh, no one's going to do this work for me. And it's, <laughs> yeah. it's actually, there's no easy shortcut. I feel like, yeah, Scorpio knows a lot about how there's no easy shortcut. I think that is very true and very wise. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> And next we get to say that, you know, Jupiter, who has been retrograde, mm. re-enters Pisces. Um, wow. For me, that's on October 28th. Um, mm -hmm. It could also be October 27th, depending on your time zone, that nighttime. Mm. Um, and this is sort of the beginning of the end um, yeah. of Jupiter and Pisces. It's our last drink of Jupiter and Pisces for about 12 years. <laughs> so yeah, the third um, ingress, the third and final re-ingress into Pisces. Yeah. How are you thinking about this, this final re-entrance? Yeah, I mean, I think so far in our conversation, October feels like some kind of, you know, liminal terrain <laughs> where everything's being wrapped up somehow, <laughs> you know, like a, the, like the planets going through re like revolving doors of like mm. departing and arriving. So yeah, like Jupiter's re-entry into Pisces. So it will sort of like go as far back as 28 degrees and then sort of go direct again so by December 20 and it will re-enter Aries I mean I think this is like a moment of 
you know, ritualizing your your gratitude <laughs> for Jupiter having spent its time in Pisces. So in it on a personal level, the Pisces area of your chart must have gone through some kind of growth and expansion but even traditionally Jupiter is about medicine and healing so there's something about that that maybe this this Jupiter Pisces transit in the past year must have been about like finding ways of you know how you've grown since then and how you sort of can integrate maybe some of the sweetness that Jupiter must have brought up. And in a way, it's also possible that Jupiter didn't necessarily bring like sweetness, you know, there could have been just like benevolent truths that you had to like really face that was like also really painful or difficult, potentially, but I feel like in a way, like it liberates you somehow, you know, like as you move forward. So I definitely personally would most likely do some kind of Jupiter <laughs> veneration to like express some gratitude. Um, and that can look a lot different for everyone in terms of like practices, but just even like being in a space of gratitude is just like, I feel like just like would be really sweet to commemorate the last few weeks of Jupiter being in Pisces. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great recommendation. And just thinking about how I relate to Jupiter or have been relating to Jupiter and Pisces. It's like, you know, there is things that are expanding, but sometimes expanding is hard. Like if your mm -hmm. life grows, you have yeah. to stretch and stretching is like hard, or at least it is for me where it just feels like, oh, there's too much or there's so much. And how do I hold this up or manage it? Or, mm -hmm. and I've been thinking about every time Jupiter's kind of popped in and out of Pisces, whether it was on the Aquarius side or the Aries side, just this sense of like, you know, is there anything that you're still thirsty for? Like, what is, mm -hmm. what is waiting for you to drink up? Do you need to fill up your water bottle before, you know, you go back to Aries? Like it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's a really short journey. So Jupiter will leave mm -hmm. Pisces again for good. I think a couple of days before Christmas, I think it's the 21st, mm -hmm. December 20th or 21st, depending so. where you are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so what's, what's here? Is there anything still here that you need to soak up? Is there any unfinished business, unfinished gratitude? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I don't mean anything you need to soak up in like an extractive way, um, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. more just like, you know, because Jupiter and Pisces is here. I just, it just feels so full of receiving to me and it feels mm -hmm. very wide open and very mystical and connected to everything that is widely true or like big mm -hmm. picture true. And I think if there's any mm -hmm. ways that we want to, get into that lens or have some reminders or mantras or mm. mementos of what that is for us, then this could be a good opportunity to do that. Mm, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I feel like Jupiter's time in Pisces has been really supportive, supportive of like meaning making in mm -hmm. the face of like suffering or struggle. Um, and I feel like that's such a beautiful thing around what you mentioned um, with the, you know, like what you're thirsty for. But um, like I was thinking also about Jupiter you know, like the beautiful thing about astrology is that it just requires context all the time. So when you said that expansion and growth is not inherently good, I think that's such a good, I feel like that's such a recommended way of thinking about astrology, you know, like, for example, we were talking about just before how Venus and the moon can have a harder time in Scorpio, but that's not inherently bad or doomy, exactly. nor does Jupiter rejoicing and being happy in Pisces because it's at home is inherently going to be comfortable and that's where you know so much nuance is possible and we we're, there's like so many of us um in this world <laughs> um will have such vastly different experiences but yeah like it's it, this is definitely the moment of like wrap up and saying goodbye to Jupiter Pisces and we'll see Jupiter and Pisces again in 12 years <laughs> yeah later <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so we just have two other things to talk yeah, about. My um, gosh, yeah. Mercury, I know we made it. Um, Mercury is going to enter Scorpio on October mm -hmm. 29th. And mm -hmm. um, I have some bias towards Mercury and Scorpio. I always <laughs> think of Mercury and Scorpio like buried under a pile of books. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, just always kind of finding themselves like doing the research and tracing the yes. footnotes all the way back to the original source and like looking for the, the lie or the, it has a very like 
CSI vibes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's very like, so I'm a spy about everything, uh, even <laughs> if it's not trying to be. <laughs> yeah. I love that level of focus, like that sort of like rigor of commitment to like, just like really like going in search of like the truth. <laughs> yeah. And the precision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. drawing like the red the red strings from like this point to that point and everyone's like how did you get here and you're like no if you just read all these things then <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that's that meme that I'm imagining in my head yeah exactly like... <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean I think like Mercury yeah Mercury Mercury in Scorpio is like um having the sense of uh sort of like audacity to uncover things that are maybe like hard to stomach also you know mm -hmm. Scorpio is really good at that like the hard mm -hmm. to stomach kind of content <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah. there's a little bit of like a cognitive um integration with Mercury entering you know joining like Venus and the sun in Scorpio this time around and in a way like I guess this happening uh, sort of like yeah like a few days after the solar eclipse that might be really helpful actually in terms of understanding you know what what the solar eclipse could have been about yeah mm, yeah I like that just like maybe even bringing some like pragmatism or just like breaking things down and like giving language to things that are helpful mm -hmm. um, even though as you said that language may be something that takes gumption to say or um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know it has like <laughs> I just have another, I'm only thinking in memes right now. It's like Mercury and Scorpio is like, totally. everything is delivered with the middle finger. It's just like, you know, it's like, and middle finger. Yeah, um, totally. So like, it has some gumption to it, but it can help us maybe break things down and bring some of the sort of, what do we do with this? Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. that, I think it's really helpful. I like that mm -hmm. you mentioned that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I think, you know, it's even more of note that, you know, the sun. Okay. So now we have sun, Venus, Mercury, all in Scorpio, which is a vibe, mm -hmm. but then mm -hmm. now they're all ruled by Mars who is about mm -hmm. to sort of get a little hangry and go retrograde. Mm -hmm. And so Literally. they'll sort of all be under Mars's things, which leads us to October 30th, where Mars yeah. stations retrograde in Gemini yeah. and, um, and they'll be retrograde for 74 days. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, October ends with the bang. <laughs> It does. What do you yeah. have to say about, I mean, obviously the whole Mars transit is a big topic, but you know, mm -hmm. the going retrograde and all of that, how are you feeling mm -hmm. about that? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> I feel like, I guess when I was thinking about Mars, I mean, this is, this is something we experience with Mars, you know, like Mars would retrograde in a sign every two years or so. So it's, it's, you know, we expect it this timeline, but I guess like in a way, cause Mars can just have such an agitating influence and like, it's like sandpaper feeling <laughs> on, <laughs> you know, like it feels, it feels like a little bit like tough um, sometimes, but I guess like Mars um, in Gemini thinking of the Scorpio pileup, which is also expected, you know, because usually that's what happens, like the inner planets tend to follow the sun, uh, depending on where it is, um, that Mars is in, in not in a major aspect, or sort of like we think of us in aversion, or like the metaphor of driving like in the blind spot of the Scorpio planets, which Mars is responsible for. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I guess when we think of Mars slowing down, you know, like, the significations of Mars, like, which is about direct action or um, sort of like being really deliberate or um, even like the action of like severing and like, you know, taking things apart, um, particularly in the sign of Gemini, there's like a very cognitive intellectual quality to that process as well. Um, perhaps, you know, those things are kind of needing to slow down or you you know there's there's a need to um take a step back I suppose in terms of what Mars in Gemini has been about like at least since like around August end of August when it entered this area of your chart and this is retrograde moments are always a time of review and reassessment and just reflection um, but yes Mars is I guess going from 25 degrees 
all the way back to eight degrees. <laughs> it's like, oh, wow. Yeah, it's just like going to go all the way back to almost the beginning <laughs> of Gemini until, yeah, January 11th, 2023. So we have that retrograde Mars for some time. Yeah. And it feels like, you know, we have the Venus, Sun, Mercury, and Scorpio not really able to see their ruler Mars, who's now going, it's like, okay, well, if we can't see, then maybe we should be slowing down <laughs> because mm -hmm, we can't mm -hmm. see right now. Um, mm -hmm. and we can't see far, I guess. And mm -hmm. yeah, that retrograde in Mars sort of like ping ponging in between the U S natal Uranus and the U S natal oh. Mars mm -hmm. on this retrograde, which is oh. interesting, um, Ooh. is a nice way to say it, I think. Oh. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I just think, you know, how do we, how do we channel our direct action when we are feeling aggra aggravated or when we're feeling mm -hmm. angsty? Like, what do we, how do we disperse our energy in a way that's effective and like, you know, still brings courage, but it doesn't necessarily have to be dispersed to the point of violence. Like, I think mm -hmm. if I'm thinking about it on like a personal level, like how we can mm -hmm. kind of reckon with that energy or integrate that energy that maybe um, this mm -hmm. retrograde might bring up some of those things. Yeah, and I guess like when you kind of delineate Mars in Gemini, Mars in Gemini can be quite a trickster energy, you know, like sort of like have this vibe of like, can be really confident at what they say and appear like they know what they're talking about. But then it's like, do you really? <laughs> you know, there's that, there's that kind of energy <laughs> to Mars in Gemini. So it's like this retrograde is a bit of a, an opportunity to kind of just be like okay what are you really saying you mm -hmm. know and what are you know like when I think of Gemini as the sign of Mercury um you know so that's an interesting actually like some kind of averse mutual reception between Mars and Mercury at this this month is to like okay what all of all the information you have been gathering, like Mars have been gathering, you know, what is what is gonna stick? You know, like the retrograde period is like a bit of like filtering through maybe like the excessive noise um for this time and seeing what you read, what you truly really kind of like wanna move forward. Cause at the end of the day, I feel like the bigger picture of a Mars transit in your Gemini house would be like Mars is like mobilizing things, you know, in, in this, in the next seven months there, you know, like things are going to be moving around and, you know, like things need to kind of move forward because that's Mars. Mars like wants to move things along. And so this retrograde is actually a good time to kind of like step back and re regroup. So, yeah, no, I love, I love mm -hmm. all of that. Yeah. How do you back it up? Like mm -hmm. you can just say things like, how do you back it up? Um, mm -hmm. Mercury and Scorpio mm -hmm. back there, like doing all the research. Um, mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah, just a lot of movement in a sign that already likes a lot of movement. So a lot of things are, are cooking and moving in that sign mm -hmm. for sure. So, you know, it makes me think too of like, you know, for, um, for example, people who love to study or love to learn, you know, sometimes like, part of part of like imposter syndrome for example is like I'm gonna take another course to help mm -hmm. me feel more like an expert or like to make me feel a lot more capable and I feel like so this is just like a context exam example but the Mars retrograde in a way can be like maybe you don't need to take another yet another course like this is maybe a time to have that the things you've been learning and embody them mm -hmm. somehow and not just like add more things to your own sort of like um, data <laughs> to feel like you have everything you need in order to function um, so there's something about that like a you know that sort of like vibe that I'm imagining with this Mars retrograde mm, so I love that They're like what do you do with what you already have mm -hmm, like, yeah mm -hmm, no I love mm -hmm. that well that, that's been quite an eventful month but, uh <laughs> I feel like we just kind of went through it <laughs> yeah. we'll go through it again mm -hmm. um is there anything that you would like to say in closing before you tell us all your deets and where people can find you and learn more yeah. about you, what you got going on yeah, as I was saying how like uh, in our conversation, it didn't quite land when we were preparing for this episode, but in our conversation, yeah, just like kind of realizing how October feels like such a, a liminal 
space, you know, in, in this slice of time of 2022, where there's a lot of like, yeah, paradoxical loops. And we talked about wormholes and <laughs> different depths, different gravitational, you know, like energy, just, I feel like um, if folks are feeling like, especially because we started the month with like a Mercury direct. So if folks feel like, oh yes, all things go. And then you start to feel like actually not, you know, this might be just like allow yourself the space to really slow down. And also that um, even with all this intensity, you don't necessarily have to personally identify with the intensity either, right? Like, I guess the way we talk about astrological weather is that at times it's it's just like on a very objective level. Um, it might not neatly translate to a personal experience, but you can definitely kind of like investigate where that could be happening for you in detail. But yeah, October as a month feels totally liminal as like this ending, beginning, ending. Mm-hmm add infinity <laughs> yeah the revolving door felt a mm-hmm. good image um, mm-hmm. that I liked it's like it was, a it's like a union station like in like a transportation system where all the trains converge mm-hmm. and depart in all different in directions um, where can people find out more about Ooh. you, find out about your work? If you have anything coming up that you'd like people to know about, would you mind sharing it with us? Oh, yes. Uh, so you can find me in the digisphere, in the <laughs> digital world that we all live in and frequent. I am at charmastrology.com. And when it comes to social media, I'm only on Instagram. So at charmastrology. And in terms of what's coming up, I I feel like I have been laying low a lot in 2022, actually. (laughs) And it feels really good. It feels feels really good to sort of um, be a little bit more sort of invisible in that sense, like digitally, at least. But I have been kind of gearing up and wanting to do small group, unrecorded sessions of like learning and gathering sessions that talk about things like the Mars retrograde or you know the eclipse season or even just like eventually like Saturn going into Pisces so on my website people can sign up for my newsletter because that will be like the first place where I'll announce a sign up so that would be me kind of like stretching myself too and like sort of experimenting facilitating groups, which I have had many years of experience in other contexts outside of astrology. Uh, but this would ultimately be, I, in a way, like my first time doing it on my own. So as as you know, you you, you do those things. There's a lot of work involved mm-hmm. in, in facilitation and just like group teaching and gathering. So I'm kind of excited to do a bit of that. And my intention to do it in like a small space and it being unrecorded is I would really ideally love to meet people who sort of like kind of intentionally set aside the time to be present in that kind of space, which, you know, is very hard. Um, But me personally, I tend to, you know, kind of before like pile up on courses, like passively, and then sort of, I feel like it has a different quality when you sort of go and enter a space like live. So that's what's coming up for me. Um, yeah, that's that's it. And I do do consultations still. So that's that's still like the love, the labor of love <laughs> of astrology, seeing people one on one. So people can definitely see me for consultation. It's all on my website. Cool, beautiful. Well, thanks so much for coming. I had a lot of fun doing this with you. I feel like my face hurts a lot because I just like really enjoyed being in conversation with you and talking about all of this. So thanks for being here. Thank you so much.